What what? Uh, welcome to Rahalastapa. It's another one for you, my fine friends. And this week we have the wonderful Bethany Black. Uh, very funny, but also covering some pretty serious and issues and some very honest stuff from uh, Bethany, who is... A fantastic comedian. I hope you will check her out if you haven't seen her before. Uh, do bear in mind, you can become a badger. Go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges. Your three pounds or more a month will help us make loads more podcasts, but also get you loads of benefits, including knowing the guests for the shows in advance, which was a benefit for anyone who wanted to see the Michael Palin one, who wants to see the Adam and Joe one, which sold out before we could even announce that to anybody else. But you also get backstage videos, you get the audio podcast ad-free and a day before everyone else, you get a secret email every month, you get entered into a prize draw, you get all sorts of other backstage uh, videos and stuff, uh, extra videos, not just the backstage ones, so like the Stone Clearing podcast and uh, snooker tournaments, but there's going to be loads of new other stuff put up in there as well. And some of my stand-up shows as well. You'll be able to see all of those uh, if you stick with us for a while. And your three pounds will be just plowed back into making more podcasts because I am crazy and I don't like having money myself. We are hoping to make a, a podcast of my sci-fi sitcom, um, which is called Everything Happens for No Reason. Uh, and hopefully that will happen in late 2020 or early 2021, depending how long it takes to write it and secure the cast, because I'm hoping to get the cast we had for the Channel 4 taster tape that Channel 4 foolishly turned down. They will learn their lesson, my fan friends. Um, so anyway, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy the remarkable Bethany Black on Raha Lusta Pa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Stoller Halls in Manchester. We liked it so much we came back for a second week. Even though it's a weird lecture theatre and it was not good for podcasts. Please welcome a man who is going to stage dive all the way through this show. It's Richard Herring. Oh, yeah. Should have killed me last year. It's a, it's a lovely venue. I don't know why I said that. It's a beautiful venue. Welcome to... Uh, oh, yes, that's it. Richard Herring's Limp Swedes and Turnips podcast. It's hard to come up with these. It's so hard to come up with these. <laughs> Not very good, but it's the best I could do. I did that in the services on the way here, that one. Thought that would do. Um, that was, uh, it's a podcast about um, uh, just various tubers that aren't as hard as you expect them to be. <laughs> But I was hanging out at Canal Street the other day. It was hard to find because someone had taken all the C's and S's off the signs. And um, not even a joke, it's just true. I was in Vanilla, uh, where I proved to be equally popular with the ladies as in any other bar in the world. <laughs> anyway, they call it Rallastapa, so I don't know that's going to catch. I also popped down to Coronation Street. Someone had removed the, all the C's and S's from that as well. Oronation treat. It's not as funny, is it? It nearly, it nearly is. Weirdly, it nearly works. Uh, it's lovely to be back in Manchester. Um, uh, I was on a magic bus the other day in Manchester. You've got the magic buses. Hope you've still got those. Uh, and uh, so it is. They're magic. They're literally magic. You get on, you close your eyes, and when you open them again, you're where you want it to go. It's a magic, it's a magic bus. And also, you're covered in sick and bits of kebab. And your, wall, your wallet's magically disappeared as well. Because you're in Manchester. So all I've got, that is literally all I've got for you. So uh, it's, I'm going to welcome your guests. I called you wankers last week. I called you thieves this week. And that is all you're going to get. I love you, Manchester. My mum and dad didn't meet here, but they both came to university here. So in a way, I'm, I'm a Manchunian in a way. That's right. <laughs> One of the Manchun... Hey, all right, all right. 
how you guys speak. So, my guest this week is probably best known for her appearance on The Chase. <laughs> Though she also played Pocahontas in No Offence, which I'm really excited about as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bethany Black! Oh, come in. Sit down, there's microphones. We've got of everything. Oh, this is nice. So this is where you live, then, is This it? is my little house. This is your house. Yeah, oh, this is my... fantastic. I like these, uh, these where it's just different enough from the time tees and Yorkshire television symbols of the 70s. <laughs> To not get sued. That's these, right. That's, uh, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Now you've pointed it out, they will get sued. That's the end yeah. of the Manchester oh. Podcast Festival. Let's talk about the chase. You went on the chase. I did go on the chase, Wow, yeah. I, so I love the chase. I love the chase as well. I, I, it's one of those things that I'd, I'd like to binge watch. Yes. Uh, I will save up like three weeks worth <laughs> and then just watch them like one after another. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and like I, we'd, I'd sit there with my girlfriend watching it every day and she'd go... And I go, oh, I should go on one of these. And she went, well, you should. And I went, well, in which case I will. And, and then I applied and I turned up and I did the audition thing. And at the end of it, they said, do you know any of the chasers? And I went, yeah, I know Paul Sinha because he's a comedian. We've worked together for, for years. Uh, and I know uh, Jen uh, Ryan off, off Twitter. Yeah. And they went, oh, right, OK. So, and they, like, they did a bit of background check and they went, oh, we best check whether or not you're too famous to go on the regular <laughs> chase. <laughs> And I was like, please, like, oh, I really want to be not famous enough so that I can keep the money if I win. Yeah. I was like, I'm definitely going to beat them and hopefully everyone else on my team will get kicked out so I get to keep it all to myself. Uh, and yeah, and then they phoned me back a week later and they went, good news, you're not famous enough. <laughs> the worst thing would be if you were, you know, you were too famous to go on the, the, the civilian one but yeah, not, not famous, famous enough. enough. Yeah, I was, I Just was right in the that hinterland. Oh, yeah, yeah. To think it's where I am. Uh, <laughs> how did you get on on the chase? I did all right. I managed to beat, uh, I beat the beast. Mm. I, uh, which, not a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I went for the higher offer. Yeah. I, got, I managed to come back to, the, to my team with £42,000. Because I'm really smart. And... <laughs> And, and unfortunately, no one else on my team was. So, <laughs> so when we got to the final round, because the other thing is, I'm the unluckiest person that you've ever met. Like, genuinely, this is just like, today I opened a Lemsip and it didn't actually have any Lemsip in the sachet. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is the level of bad luck that I tend to have. <laughs> and, um, and I went on this, and like, we did really well in that, and, and the rest of my teammates went, well, you've got to pick the final questions. You've got to pick the final... Because they come out with a little velvet bag with, a, with two like ping pong balls in it right. which yeah and and you <laughs> I know exactly uh, and like you can't expect someone as filthy as me to just sort of stand there and wait for that thing to just happen and, <laughs> and move on from, uh, but they went right out and everyone on my team was going well you need to pick and I was like well I can't pick because I'm the unluckiest but if, if I pick we will get a set of questions where I can't answer a single one of them and they went no 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 you've been really lucky so far and I was like mm, not luck uh, <laughs> Knew all of the answers. And, um, and, and they still made me pick. And exactly as I said would uh. happen, happened. And I got, like, the first ten questions of it. I had no idea, like, wow. what any of them were. Yeah. So I was really angry. I came home after that, just sort of like... So you, I'm taking it you didn't win the jackpot. That's I did my not guess. win the jackpot, no. I think of all that money. How many people would you have had to share it with? It... I'd have had to share it with three people. So it would, right. I would have come away with about... I figured it out. I would have come away with £18,000, <sighs> which would have been enough to not be in debt. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cruel show it they, is really they try <laughs> really hard to make you not win it yeah they really really do they're like, they, are re yeah, they really try and make you feel intimidated as yeah. well and like, you don't meet the chaser other than they just arrive at the top of the set and they sit there and you go right okay you, 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 you're not going to talk to any of us because obviously they can't do that because then it would sudden, you know, there'd be yeah. accusations because there's already accusations. No matter who you are whenever you're on TV whenever you do anything there are always people at home and on and, and more so now on Twitter, who think that whatever it is you've said or done is absolutely a lie. <laughs> <laughs> that everything's a fix. It was like that thing of people saying, I've seen her on the telly before. And it was exactly, you know, yeah. it was I think, like, well, yeah, I have been, but this is, you know, I'm, I, I've got the shittest level of celebrity <laughs> that it's possible to have in that about once a month somebody will go, what, what, what do I, what, what have I seen you in? And I'll list everything and they'll go, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my, okay. Well, let's talk about let's talk about some of your TV appearances. I'm, 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 let's get straight into what my audience want to talk oh, about. I we wonder. might we might all we talk about. 
Um, All right, then. No offence, is it? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not no offence. It is a Doctor... You were oh, in Doctor yeah. Who. I was in Doctor you Who, You played yes. a, uh, a cloned warrior. I did, yeah. I played... uh, is it cheating to have sex with a cloned warrior? Is my first question. <laughs> No, I no. honestly don't think it is. I've been thinking about this yeah. and far more than I should have done. Uh, <laughs> if you are, if, yeah, have, if you're in a relationship ideal, with the warrior, who the, the cloned war is the cloned warrior cloned from a warrior or are they cloned from a regular person just turned into a warrior? I think that they were cloned. I think they were genetically modified. Okay. That, was the, that was the thing behind to the character. be a warrior. Because yeah, I ended up, do you know, I ended up having a, like, I ended up, one of the weirder, like, moments in my life was being sat in, in a place in, in, in a recording studio in Soho with Mark Gatiss, going, well, if this, if this episode goes really well, then we'll come back. So we just spent, like, about two hours going through so much stuff about the backstory of the character <laughs> in case they decided to have a whole army of me. And then the episode came out and over half of the fans thought it was the worst episode of Doctor <laughs> Who that had ever been recorded. And, uh, and so, it, yeah, and so I'm not going to be back in it. But I, but I could be, if enough of you... Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> um, you're a big Doctor Who fan before I write. Doctor to Who the fan. extent yeah, yeah. you said to Mark Gates something about it, this is set in, set in that... the same century as another episode. From yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it was set in the same century. It was set in the 27th century, and it's set on a moon just off Pluto, which is where uh, the Sunmakers episode was set. Of course. Um, yeah, of course. Everyone knows that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not as much of a fan of it as Toby Hayden, right? <laughs> so put, put it that way. It was just lucky I'd happened to be watching the Sunmakers that weekend. Right. <laughs> and went, oh, uh, this all ties up. And like, there were some, like, um, there were some uh, prop designs that were similar. The guns that were used right. looked like the guns from the Sunmakers as well, only like, you know, with a bit more cash thrown at them because it's not 1973. Um, but yeah, it was... Just a coincidence, though, was it? Just a coincidence, apparently, yeah. I don't know whether it was in terms of the, uh, in terms of the design, yeah. the set design, because those guys are... Worse than Toby. Yeah. Worse than Toby Haydo when it comes to these sorts of things. <laughs> Who, um, who's, yeah, who's one of five. I, I, I did, I think he's done one of your podcasts. He did, uh, he? did the Manchester Podcast Festival yeah. last year. And he knows every single actor, every single extra, every single crew member yeah. who has worked on every single Doctor Who episode ever. And, and he's a nut. Yeah, he is. I, can, he's I a couldn't nut. say yeah. it at the time. He's a fucking idiot. And then that. What a nutty yes, he idiot. Is. He's a nutty, He's very nutty nice. idiot. He's a very nutty man. <laughs> he ends up rewrites obituaries for all these, he meets all these actors yeah, and gets to know does. them and then gets writes all their obituaries. Yeah, exactly. So it's worked out pretty well for me. He's making a yeah, nice, he is, yeah. probably 150 quid a pop on those. Yeah. And that's it. And he Literally. does. He does, yeah, because he does the Who's Round podcast where he goes and talks to them. Yeah. And like almost everybody he's talked to has now died. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it was like, I think they'd had like three in one week. <laughs> and, like, the day after the third one, he went, do you want to come and do my podcast? <laughs> I, think, I don't think I can risk that, Toby. <laughs> so, what was, the, what was the experience like as a fan getting to be in Doctor <laughs> Who? I mean, that must... Could... You get... <laughs> well, I mean, did, was it, 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 were you able to... It's be, a double-edged sword. It's real double-edged sword, yeah. to be honest. Like, this, I mean, it's, it's like spending three weeks doing a really boring live-action role-play of Doctor Who, is what it is. <laughs> and it's because you've got so much time when you're not allowed to be around other people. Well, because I had, like, a full face tattoo in the episode, because some of you were sat there going, I've seen every episode of Doctor Who and you don't recognise me. I had a full face tattoo, um, which, which technically counted as a spoiler, so I wasn't allowed to go and sit in the BBC canteen with everyone else. Oh. Um, in case extras from Casualty took photographs of me because <laughs> they filmed Casualty in the studio next door um, and so yeah so I just had to go and like sit in my trailer for like the first two weeks and then it overran so we ended up shooting at the same time as they were doing the finale so at least on the final week I got to go and sit off with a bunch of Time Lords right uh, yeah and it was yeah it was great fun it was that so was who, lovely which ones were you, were you, was it Peter Capaldi was the doctor Peter Capaldi was the doctor in the, and then which, in the who else did you meet uh, Jenna Coleman right and she didn't like me very much and I think that's because I accidentally burped Red Bull in her face at the read through. <laughs> I've heard that about her. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah, she one chance Coleman. That's what they call her. Um, um, yeah, and uh, it was uh, Rhys Shearsmith was yes, was so, yeah. also in the episode, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was it was really good. It was like, do you know, it, it's it's one of those because you re you recognise when you're doing it that if you're a massive Doctor Who fan that this is probably going to be the peak of your 
life and nothing is ever going to be as good again and it kind of ruins it a bit um but <laughs> it does but it was you know it, and they were really long days and it, you, you know what it's like when you're filming like when you're filming these i can things, vaguely like, remember yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like for that especially because like I had to have this makeup and rather than paint it on, which would have taken like what twenty minutes maybe, they made that had to go in and have like one of those full head cast things that they do like with like a dental putty, oh, right? Where yeah. they go and do that. And as I went in, they went, listen, like some people panic when they've got their face covered with this and you can't breathe. Um, so you know, and because obviously you can't talk. I was like, oh, don't worry. And they're like, no, 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 you, 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 might, you might freak out. And I was like, mm, more likely I'll get turned on. But uh, <laughs> and they went, no, no, you, you'd be okay. And then they all took photographs, all stood around me whilst I had this thing on my face and I couldn't see anything. Um, but, like, so they did that so that they could go and make um, a silicon tattoo that they could then go and put over the top of it. So instead of it being sort of, like, painted on, yeah. I, had to get up, I had to go in two hours early so that they could go and spend two hours just painstakingly sticking this little tattoo to my face. And at the end of the day, the stuff that they have to remove, the prosthetic stuff in, in the makeup van, is for much thicker prosthetics. So it didn't actually work. All it did was take the colour out of it and leave me with sticky silicon all over my face. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to wash it off. So it took an hour and a half at the end of each day to take <laughs> off. So it's already a 12-hour shooting day. And then I've got an extra three hours on top of that. So it was just, I was just asleep or stood around waiting to, to, to do the episode. Um, and I'm so glad that everyone liked it as a result of that. <laughs> I thought it was a good one. I, did, well, I watched that one. I thought it was a good I one. Thought it was, I really enjoyed it. Like, and Because I've managed to get enough distance from it when, when I actually watched it. And one of my favourite things about it is that now, every year on my, my birthday is Christmas Eve, uh, so nearly Jesus. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so every year on, on my birthday, the Doctor Who online Twitter account wishes me a happy birthday. Because I, I don't think there's anyone else who's been in Doctor Who with a Christmas Eve birthday. Toby will be sat at home right now getting fucking <laughs> furious, going, there are seven other actors and three extras. Um, yeah, and so they always go, happy birthday to Bethany Black, which then means I get an hour and a half of like the angriest nerds on Twitter <laughs> all telling me how much they hated the episode and how I ruined the show for them. And it's, it's just the best birthday present I could ever ask for. <laughs> Doctor Who fans are a special breed of people. I mean, I... I did an audio thing for them years ago, yeah. and then I went along to some signings for that. And I, I kind of admire how much, how dedicated they are to the show, and how you know how just they know what they like, and they're yeah. not they're not embarrassed about it at all. Which they nor should they be, but they're not. But well, they yeah. should be. Uh, but then you know they're grown men, grow up. But <laughs> nearly all men. Uh, hey, you but, say that, but I once spent an evening with the Derby Doctor Who Society. <laughs> <laughs> when I was giving, because I, I was Toby Haydock's driver when he did a show about Doctor oh, Who, right. uh, so he was fucking furious when I got cast in it. <laughs> it was like, what, it's like th thirty years I've been into it, and they cast my fucking driver. And and I'll tell you, I have never felt more attractive than the evening I spent <laughs> with the Derby Doctor Who Society. The, the Derby ones are yeah. the, the ugliest. Everyone Particular. knows that. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows that about the Derby. We've seen Derby. We know what it's like. <laughs> so let's, we'll talk a bit yeah. more about acting, I think, later on. But um, let's get into how you got into stand-up. What, what was the impetus to get into stand-up? Because you... Right, I, was, I'd failed at everything else. Right. Uh, I think that's, that's the usual way to go, isn't yeah. it? You know, a failing at everything else. Uh, and an, a, a pathological need to be liked by people and, yeah. and an inability to really enjoy anything. What were you, I think that's... What were you doing before? Did we... Well, I'd, yeah, like, I'd, I'd, well what I'd done is I'd, 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 I wanted to act like when I was a kid and then I met performing arts students and that really put me off. <laughs> and so I, I, I went off to college and I studied film and television. I was going to get into writing and like, I'd like, spent ages trying to get a, a film made and that wasn't working. And I ended up doing like data entry. In a, in a, in, <laughs> I ended up having to log all of the holes in Liverpool. Right. All of the holes in the street in Liverpool. This was the data entry job that I had. I had to go and put, like, I had to go and turn the paper, like the things that the, the, uh, that the surveyors had gone and written, they would written it all down on these sheets. And then we had to go and like computerise them and I had to go and put in exactly where they were logged right. in the thing. Uh, and I was in a place in Blackburn, which was like perfect, measuring all of the holes in yeah. Liverpool in Blackburn. And... And so I ended up, and, and I just remember being sat there just going, well, is this my life now? Is this what I have to do? I need to get out of here and, and do some stand-up. And I, like, that was the last thing that I sort of had. I went, it can't be worse than doing this, can it? <laughs> and then one of my friends said, We've got a, we, we run a, a rock night and we want somebody to go on between the, between the bands oh, God, okay. and do stand-up. And I went, 
yeah, all right, I'll give that a go, and then tried to write a set and uh, wrote, I think I must have written about an hour's worth of material, <laughs> of which I got one laugh. <laughs> all of these people going, what the fuck are you doing? We're here to watch rock. Yeah, and the hardest place to do comedy it, is, it, it, is anything with music around. Yeah, it really is. And that was sort of like the thing that then, I was like, right, okay, actually, once I got that one laugh, I was like, I think I can probably get more. <laughs> I, think, I think I can figure out how I do this. And, yeah. and that was the thing that sort of got me, got me onto that and, and giving up on everything else okay. in my life. Because I read somewhere that you felt, you felt you were too young to get into stand-up, but then you saw yeah, Josie Long. Yeah, no, that's true. That's also true. Yeah, because I spent so much time going, I really wanted to do... Because it was, it was that thing of wanting to do stand-up because I, like, I was a, such a comedy nerd when I was a kid. I was like, I, I, just old enough to, uh, to remember the sort of... I used to sneak downstairs and watch the young ones through the crack in the door and right. all of that stuff and, and Fist of Fun and, uh, right, you know, all of... That was a bit later. That was a bit later. <laughs> yeah, I was at college when Fist of Fun came out and we just would go around shouting about jelly and <laughs> calling things flighty. And, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, just, like, such a massive comedy nerd and I always, like, thought that the people on TV were about ten years older than, than I was at the time. Yeah, I thought they were all, like, in their 30s and 40s, but oh, I'm far too young to do that. And I remember listening to the BBC... Um, it was the BBC stand-up competition that they have every year. Yeah. And one year, Josie Long had won. And I realised that she was, like, four years younger than me. And I yes. went, right, OK, well, I'm old enough then, definitely. <laughs> and that was the thing that sort of gave me the impetus to cool. sort of to go, actually, I can probably do this. And then at the same time, having a string of shitty jobs, I got fired from like 14 day jobs in a single year. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's when you go, do you know what? Maybe I'm the cunt. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe it isn't them. And uh, yeah, and, and I genuinely, I did. I got, I got like fired from all of those. And one of them, the one that made me go, right, I absolutely have to make a living at stand-up was I was working for a credit card company uh, in a call centre, and and my boss, that was literally that thing of the boss going, if you worked hard, you could have my job in the next five years. <laughs> and I walked out and just never came back. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> nope, <laughs> I can't think of anything worse. You couldn't yeah. have, yeah, and that was it. And after that, it's just, yeah, I then went back to college, I went back to university to just to get the student loan so that I could go off and do stand-up. Right. <laughs> and do the bare minimum. I was like, oh, what's the easiest thing I could do for a degree? Uh, cultural studies, that sounds dead easy. <laughs> Let's do that. So I did that. And yeah. unfortunately, it's meant that I learned how to predict all of the horrible shit that we've currently got going on. Okay. I mean, sorry, you're four months in the future, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, tell... uh, what, sorry? You should know what it is. Though, I should know what it is, yeah, yeah. In, 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 this, uh, yeah in this fantastic communist paradise of... <laughs> Of the Democratic People's Republic of the Island of the UK, um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, so yes, yeah, so like it's yeah, I, I yeah, just really loved stand up more than yeah. anything else, and 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 then accidentally fell into acting. Like, and this is the thing because everyone always basically, I I was never particularly successful at stand up. Like, I love it, uh, and I've got really good at it recently, but for a very long time. I would go on stage and just upset people. Um, <laughs> don't know whether it was just my mere presence. A lot of the time, like for the first couple of years, I was desperately trying to like come up with anything that I thought was funny yeah. and was only ever funny by accident. And then realised, oh right, oh that bit was funny and that bit was. And it took a long time to learn how to do what I do, and um, yeah, just spent so much time doing that and really, really struggling with it. And just being at that point where you're just about making enough money to do it and having too many gigs to actually get a real job but not <laughs> enough gigs to sort of get on with your life uh, in any real enjoyable way um and i was like really really struggling at it and then i just sort of managed to break that the back of that and started to get enough work and then i broke my leg uh, in the middle of what was like the work most already this was like the end of the unluckiest year that i'd ever had i got dumped just before i was supposed to be getting married and like, and it just got worse from there. I ended up having to move my back in with a group of comedians. Right. Um, flat sharing with comedians when you're in your mid thirties is, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, um, yeah, it was awful. I nearly bled to death in the shower. That was a weird one. I managed to knock a toothbrush mug over. Like, I told you I was the unluckiest person. Knock a toothbrush mug over, yeah. which then severed a vein in my ankle, and I oh nearly bled out. 
this was like two days after Christmas. This was on my 33rd birthday, right? And I just like, again, the near, you know, Christmas Eve, nearly Jesus, got to 33 and went, <laughs> fuck it, I've just got to make it past Boxing Day. <laughs> yeah. Got to make it past Good Friday and I'm golden, right? Yeah. And then two days later, hubris caught up with me and I nearly bled to death in a shower. <laughs> and because um, and, I remember just like dropping dropping the glass into the shower, looking down and going, oh, it didn't cut me. And then getting out and looking down, I went, oh, fuck, no, it did. And then knocking on my flatmate's door who answered it, and I was sort of stood there with a towel and just, I, 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 think, I, th I think I've hurt myself. Because I looked around for anything to sort of stop the bleeding. There were two little, right, Q-tip type cotton buds in there. And that is not going to work. <laughs> knocked on the door, and he's just like, you all right? I think, I think I've hurt myself. And then just collapsed and dropped the towel and had everyone in my flat, in my flat scurrying around to sort of, like, resuscitate me. And, like, it's the most embarrassing thing, being rescued naked on your own landing. <laughs> I have no idea why they were naked. But I... <laughs> if anything, it was awkward. Uh, <laughs> get out of the face. Um, yeah, and so it was just like I had a, a long run in that year of just like really, really bad things. Like, like, and, and then, at the end of it all, then I broke my leg That's... and then couldn't work for 18 months because I couldn't walk. Because, again, the unluckiest person in the world, I had uh, I developed an allergy to the metal that they'd used to fix my leg with. Because who has a titanium allergy? <laughs> And so I couldn't walk properly. And so we ended up, like, I met my partner sort of, like, during that time. So, you know, things got even worse. And, <laughs> no, and then, and, like, we'd reached the point where, I, like, I couldn't afford to pay the rent. I'd run up massive amounts of debt. And I'd phoned up the Citizens Advice Bureau to sort of go, like, how do you declare bankruptcy? Like, because I guess you can't just go into your bank and you go, uh, I'm bankrupt. Like, it doesn't work like yeah. that. And they said, you need to fill in some forms. And there's a, a £512 fee. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> to declare bankruptcy? Like, yeah, yeah, it's 500. I was like, well, I haven't got that. And they went, well, could you not borrow it? <laughs> so that's how I got in this mess. <laughs> and who are you going to ask? Like, basically, who are you going to ask to borrow 512 pounds to declare bankruptcy? <laughs> what do you need it for? Um, so I can get a bit of paper that says I don't owe you anything. <laughs> like, that's... Isn't that how this is going to work? And I, yeah, and I... And, and, uh, and so I'd, I'd, like, I'd phone them up, put the phone down, and was just sort of sat there on my bed going, well, this is, this is, I don't even know what to do. I'm not even rich enough to declare bankruptcy. <laughs> like, I'm absolutely screwed. And, about, and three of my friends had gone and sent me like, uh, messages on Facebook saying, you need to audition for this role. And like, as a comedian, you'd often, I'd often get things from people saying, oh, I've got an open casting for this. This one sounds like you. You should go for this. And three people had sent it to me. And, uh, and I remember your rule. Three people tell you that to do something, you have to do it. Um, and they all said, you should audition. You should go for this audition. And I did. I, I emailed them immediately. It was for uh, Cucumber, for Russell T. Davies. Yeah. And I emailed them there and then. It was like the Monday afternoon. I got the audition on the Thursday. Did the audition. The, uh, Andy Pryor, the casting director for that, and for Doctor Who, phoned me on the Saturday and said, uh, can you come back in for a call back on Tuesday? Went in on the Tuesday. That evening, I got a phone call telling me I got the, got the role. Two days after that, we did the read-through. And three days after that, we started filming. And so my life just turned around immediately. Amazing. And like, on the read-through, when I arrived, he said, oh, don't be, don't be worried about the read-through. Like, I, know, I know you'll be nervous. And I was like, I had no idea you were supposed to be nervous because <laughs> I'm a stand-up. And being sat in a room with a bunch of other people with the words in front of you that you've got to say seems, <laughs> seems a little bit too easy, if you ask me. Anyway. <laughs> He said, well, don't worry. It's like, do you know what, a do you know what happens at a read-through? And I said, I've seen enough Doctor Who Confidential to know what happens at, like, <laughs> at a read-through. And they went, oh, he said, oh, you a Doctor Who fan? I said, yes, I am. And he went, I cast that, and I pretended I didn't know. And went, oh, really? <laughs> and he said, yeah, would you like to be in it? And I went, yes, please. <laughs> I was like, well, this is day one as an actor. This is a piece of piss. <laughs> Can't really get any easier than that, and yeah, and and that was kind of, and it was like it was about eighteen months later when I did when when he I, yeah he got in touch and said do you want to do Doctor Who yeah. and that was fantastic as well. I mean it was like I said it was really difficult and my partner was there and and on one day she came down for a set visit and and um, it was really it was a really tough episode to film because it was all sort of like point of view shots. Yeah. So it was constantly just sort of like so you all as well as acting and remembering what you had to say and where you had to be, you also had to be aware of exactly how it was going to look when the camera was from your perspective. So okay. you needed to make sure you so it just added an extra level of difficulty to it. So everybody's tempers were frayed. Yes. Everybody was really, really struggling. And we'd spent all day trying to get this one shot with and it was only me. 
Peter and Jenna on, on, on the set by this point. And we've been trying to get this shot, and it was really, really difficult to get. And like, I think it was like take like 12 or 13 of it, and somebody walked through my eye line, and I nearly went full Christian Bale, sort of, <laughs> fuck, do you think you did get out of my eye? And I realised that it was David Tennant, <laughs> who'd arrived on a set visit. And like, I just suddenly went really like, <laughs> you're my favourite doctor. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Um, <laughs> And it was just, it was the strangest thing. And, and just watching those, watching those two interact, and then Russell was there as well. So, you know, two doctors and a showrunner. It's like, yeah. you know, being a Catholic and meeting two popes and God, isn't it? You know? <laughs> and Peter said uh, to David, like, did you ever get to have a go on my TARDIS? And he said, no, I didn't. He said, would you like to? And I was like, holy shit, this can't get any better. And he went, yeah, yes, please. And he said, well, let me take you up to the TARDIS then. And we walked round, and the set's like on three floors. So we walked up the outside walked up the stairs on the outside, got to the door, and he opened, opened the main TARDIS door and went, come aboard. And you only get one chance. You've got to not fuck it up. So when you go in, you've got to go... <laughs> <laughs> it's bigger! <laughs> on the, I fucking nailed it as well. Like, absolutely spot on. And, and we were messing around. We were like, all of us just spent like the next 20 minutes just messing about on the TARDIS console. Was the director annoyed that you disappeared to play in the TARDIS for the afternoon? <laughs> when you were the no, he was all right with yeah, it, actually. He, he, was, yeah, he was just like, no, I've had enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of you pricks. I'm going off somewhere else. Yeah, no, they were... He was absolutely fine with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was... Um, I think it was like the, the end of the Friday afternoon. So it was... Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. messing around. Yeah. Lad bringing games. It was already overdue. It had already gone over, over right. budget and, and over like schedule by about a week. So. Cool. Um, so with the stand up though, you've yeah. uh, when how long before you did like you did an Ed, was your Ed, Beth becomes her your... Beth becomes her was my first Edinburgh, Edinburgh show. show. Yeah, that was oh, that had been nine years ago because I realised the other day it was like it was uh, ten uh, no. Yeah, it was 2008 I did that, because it, um, yeah, it was the end of October 2007 was the first time I did that show live. Right. And that was my first hour show, and I did that at Vanilla, yeah. um, as mentioned. Because I used to run a comedy night there, and it was, like, it was one of those things where everybody who performed there is now far more famous and successful than me. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> I've got this thing, so I'll be able to use this as a vehicle. And like, the people we had playing that, Joe Lysett had his first ever gig there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarah Millican was, was, like, was on there, Gary Delaney, Paul Sinha, there's just like so many of them who've just like gone out and like, oh, right, okay. But um, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, that was my first show about, yeah, 12 years ago now. Okay, so, old. I mean, you, you've, I mean, out of all the, you've got a lot of things to talk about in your life. I do. I, I mean, like, yeah. you've, I most think... comedians have like one of the things yeah, that you great. have. And you've yeah. got all of I've them. I've got all of them. <laughs> I've got all of them. I've just been really greedy and I've ruined it. I've got all sorts of things. Yeah, because uh, yeah, the first show was my coming out show, which is about being trans, uh, about being transgender, which I assume you all are. Because um, <laughs> you all look it, so don't worry. <laughs> Not one of you looks like you're cisgendered and that's, you, you've done well there. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, you know how bad some of them look. Uh, <laughs> I just think, what's the point? Um, no, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm trans. And that show was, that was, yeah, that was, because I thought, like, initially I was like, well, this is a good USP. I mean, not, like, initially when I came out as trans. Yeah. When I did the show, <laughs> I wasn't like, I oh, mean, some you know comedians what? would Everyone think... needs a gimmick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some comedians would go, yeah, I think, so, this, is, I I think, think this is worth it for the, yeah, yeah. For the press, I'll get Yeah, get... mentioning, you know, <laughs> Will Franken. And, <laughs> yeah, and do you know what? And, uh, yeah, and... Uh, I, yeah, so the show was all about that. It was all about coming out and and my family's reaction to that because because that was the thing that was so difficult about because like coming out as trans like in in the end of the nineties was a very different place to to sort of like come out than, than it is now. And it was very very difficult and very you know absolutely terrifying to do that. And so I'd had all and and like lots of people when they come out, I had this whole idea of how I would react to anything and. Everybody was just fucking blasé about it, and it was <laughs> just ruined it. Like, I had absolutely nothing to fight against whatsoever. None of my family disowned me. It was awful. <laughs> like, you don't know how difficult that is when you're going, I've got an Edinburgh show to write. <laughs> Come on, one of you pricks has got to say something really upsetting, and, and they genuinely didn't. I mean, the weirdest one was my uncle, who I absolutely loved to pieces, who was like desperate. It's like he's, a, he's been a lorry driver for his entire life. I'm, I'm, my, when I try and describe my family, it's, I always end up sounding like a 17th century urchin because uh, <laughs> my dad was a blacksmith 
And... <laughs> And he met my mum. He was a blacksmith's apprentice when he met my mum. And she was... Um, she sold uh, cockles in pubs. <laughs> Genuinely true. And, <laughs> and she had gone into the pub that his parents had, had owned. And, um, and he'd said, have you got crabs, love? And, and it was her first day, so she'd never heard that before. And, <laughs> and she thought, he seems nice. And, uh, but yeah, so my, my parents like retrained and gone off. My dad retrained to become a, a teacher. My mum eventually went off to college and retrained and became a probation officer. But, um, but you know, so my, my, own, like my dad's side of the family, you know, like old working class like, family from all over the place. But my uncle was a lorry driver and everyone was like a little bit, do you know, maybe he might be a bit weird. And my grandma, who was a bit sort of Peggy Mitchell over the whole thing, was like, if he steps out of line, I'll, I'll have words with him. I'll give him shit, you know. And we, 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 she, my grandma organised, uh, I, I am assuming, the first gender reveal party of, <laughs> of all time. Uh, and, like, invited everyone over. And, like, at one point, he came over to chat to me and he went, listen, they all think I'm a bit weird. And they, like, they were worried. Like, I, I know that they thought I might be a bit off with you but I just want, want you to know I've been, I've been a long distance lorry driver for 30 years so I have seen things <laughs> <laughs> I went oh right he said yeah there's a guy I know in Belgium right who wears a cardigan <laughs> <laughs> and that was like his step into this other world it was like, <laughs> it was like oh so you knew you'd be okay with me that's good <laughs> right this is this is fun so yeah that was that was my first show and it's like yeah because on top of that like yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, because I'm also, because I'm autistic as well, which you've probably noticed. Uh, and I have ADHD, and I have quite a lot of mental health problems, um, partly as a result of all three of those things. Like, I don't, I don't go out other than to go to work. Um, yes, yeah, so you're agrophobic. Agrophobic, yeah, yeah, I've got, like, prob And I didn't realise that I had agrophobia either. That was, like, one of those things. Like, when my therapist told me that, I was like, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Because it was like, because like initially she said, oh, yeah, because you know, because of the agoraphobia. And I went, what are, you, what are you talking about? That's like, you know, like in, in this 90s sitcom Game On where you're a mad fantasist who never leaves your house. Or, you know, like the Sigourney Weaver movie Copycat where you just go and like spend your life on the internet. Oh, yeah, no, that is me, isn't it? <laughs> that is who I am. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of that comes down to the a combination of ADHD and autism and also being trans and being terrified. Because the amount of shit that I get online, everyone hates me. Yeah. <laughs> I get it from all angles. It's... Uh, well, it's... I mean, it's... Right across the political spectrum. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, it's interesting because I think it's... Uh, like, like you say, you came out very, very early as trans. Yeah. Like in the... I remember the 80s and 90s... The, I'm, you know, I remember what the attitudes of people were like, you know, you know and I, I guess, you see it in yeah. comedy as well, it was just like a, it was a, even up into the 2000s, really, people yeah. were just, this is funny, someone is, is a different sex, than, or wants to be a different sex than they are, how funny is that? They still do that, there's, yeah. and there's still comics, like, there's, what I love is that there are certain comics who are fucking cowards, because I have discovered that there are a lot more comedians doing material about trans people than I've ever seen. Right. There are so many of them. Right. It's like, oh, oh, you just don't do it when I'm on a bill with you, do you? Right, okay. That says a lot about it. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, there was, there was a, 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 I've forgotten her name, there was a trans comedian uh, when I first started in the Sh Shirley... Shelley Cooper? Shelley Cooper, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, um, yes, yeah, so... And that was, you know, I, I, that I'd just come up to London and yeah. from Somerset, and this was like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, <laughs> this is an yeah. amazing thing. Well, it's, but, it's, but, it's really difficult. It's 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 a difficult thing to try and remember what it was like, even ten years ago, yeah. like let alone like twenty years ago when I first came out. I didn't know of any, like. Strangely enough, one of one of my school friends was also trans and had come out when they were a, when they were a teenager. They'd had like a nervous breakdown when they were about twelve years old and had ended up going to go through all sorts of therapy to to talk to somebody and and had come out as trans when they were a teenager and so got bullied so horrifically that that just made me go right. Well, I obviously can't ever let anybody know. And it was like watching somebody else live the life. I was like, so that is, my choice is either be miserable as I am or have a life as, as awful as hers was. Um, and, and, and to realise, as I, you know, that there weren't, like, because I didn't know that there were other trans people that existed anywhere else. You know, I wasn't entirely sure of that. And, you know, and I, I eventually, like, when I was 17, I, I spoke to my GP 
And that was the last thing she was expecting of a Tuesday morning in a, in a village of 200 people. <laughs> in the late 90s. Uh, Dr. France, for the one person who knows who that is in the audience. <laughs> Hi, Bron. Um, my mate Bron's in the audience. We've been friends since we were 11, haven't we? Yeah, we went to school together. Um, I'm both now working comedy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why that's anything, really. <laughs> but... Um, but I remember going and chatting to, yeah, going and talking to, to my GP and she sort of like went and did loads of research, was like really, really great about it and, and got me to go and see, uh, I went to go and see a psychiatrist at the, local, at the local hospital who was the first person to use correct pronouns when talking about me in anything. And that was just like a massive weight off my mind. It was like, oh God, because as, as a child, like you spend so much time worrying that you're weird and you are. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. You're a fucking weird because you're a kid. Kids are weird, um, but you're not weird for the things that you think you're weird about. And 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 thinking that you're you know insane, um, which is you know a legal term rather than a medical one. But um, but yeah, then talking to this psychiatrist who then did that, and that just made me. That was like such a relief for the first time. I was like, actually, this is this this is something that this feels right. Uh, unfortunately, shortly after that, he committed suicide, so I had to be reassessed. Because, again, unluckiest person you've ever met. Um, I know my psychiatrist suicide isn't really about me, but... <laughs> yeah, and... Um, yeah, and so it was really... And I, I remember shortly after I came out to my parents that there was, like, there's a local... Like, it wasn't even a local group. There's a group called uh, GIRES, which is Gender Identity Research and Education Society, who had had um, a meeting at uh, one of the pubs in the gay village uh, that was run by Julia Grant, who was in, famously in the documentary in the, in the 70s oh, yes, and 80s, yes. A Change of Sex, which was, like, the first thing that lots of people had ever heard about, about trans, transsexuals, as, as we were called then. Um... <laughs> And, and they had this meeting there, and, and I was like, right, my parents had like gone, we need to know about this, so we need to take you, we need to be as supportive as we can. And so I was the only person who turned up at this thing with like three generations of the family with them. <laughs> I was like, oh God, right, okay. Um, it was just like, really, and it was the first time I'd met other trans people in real life. And of course the internet has changed so much of that, yeah. in that it's meant that more of us are able to actually talk to each other and and be able to interact with each other and, and find out that there are other people like us and it makes the world a hell of a lot less lonely. But with that... Yeah, well, I was going to say, it seems like, you know, can, when you, in, in some ways you compare things to 20 years ago, you go, wow, the world's moved on so far, yeah. but then the downside of it is also, like, much worse as well? Or is, that, is that true, do you think? I think? I think it is, it can be, and there are ways to avoid it. What I've learned, because I have but a part of part of the various things like with the ADHD and that is that I have really extreme rejection sensitivity which is a really strange thing to do if you're a comedian yeah. which means when I die it really fucking hurts more than like soul destroying um and I, I find it really really difficult to sort of to cope with a lot of the combative side of that and it was only recently realizing like it was after I got clean and sober again as well drug addict and recovering alcoholic I got everything <laughs> <laughs> it's like super top trumps um, with the Rahalistapa top trumps <laughs> hey one person yeah, fucking the rest of you you've disappointed me and you've made Richard cry yeah. um, I'm glad you can do it in the middle of a you know a very yeah. moving life yeah. <laughs> that's that is very important that's exactly when you should be doing it um, yeah, what was I talking about oh ADHD no um <laughs> Hey! <laughs> um, uh, I can't even fucking remember what I was talking about. Uh, was anyone listening? Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about everything. When you'd yeah. gone into you're saying... Uh, I'd gone into drugs something. And, but you were talking about um, going... Oh, yeah, you know, how things have changed. Yeah, yeah, yes, and how things... To us, uh, yeah, how I did... I really struggle with the combative nature of things like... Um, like Twitter and that, uh, especially when people start to be really, really horrible, because I can't help but take it personally. And people go, oh, grow a thicker skin. I can't. Like, it's a genuine psychological condition. <laughs> that means I can't. I really, really struggle with that. So I've, I've had to reach the point where I just don't argue with people anymore. I just don't. I don't engage in yeah. any way. And I think it's sensible. I, mean, it I, I had, what were you saying about say, I had one day where, when Sam Smith 
you know, was yeah. came out as gender fluid and saying, surely use the pronouns of people that they want to use. That seems yeah. polite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I got a lot of shit that day just for saying that, <laughs> what I thought was quite a reasonable yeah. comment. Yeah, you would, because um, the second that you say something like that, yeah. suddenly you are trying to force everybody to be to be chased into toilets and yeah. and and, well, it, and have people watching you pee. Close the fucking door. <laughs> I mean, that is that is literally all you need to do. Uh, <laughs> they did seem to, from that comment to they're trying to get into the toilets. Yeah, was very fast, and then that became the obsession for yeah, most they, of the day. They're, they're so I obsessed. Think, well, you know, I can go into you can go into like the, the opposite gender's toilets without having to d yeah. mess around with your own genitals. Yeah, yeah. Do you, <laughs> you know what? If, just walk in yeah. if you want. If you're really that bothered about having a look, I honestly don't. Un yeah, I honestly don't understand this because statistically, surely you're far more likely to be attacked in a to in a woman's toilets by a member of girls allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just numbers. That's maths. Can't argue with that. <laughs> uh, but that's that's where they keep going with that, and that's yeah, yeah. you know that's one of the things that makes it difficult to go out because on top of that, it's not just it's not just when they're talking about stuff like that because it's like it's not just trans women who then go and reach the brunt of it. It's, it's also cisgender butch women as well. Like I mean, I'm trans and butch because you know, I'm just lazy, and <laughs> people always do that. What's the point? I, just, I really hate cock. I. <laughs> <laughs> Shown more of a commitment to most lesbians <laughs> to hating cock. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is fun. It we is should, fun, yeah. Well, it's, know, we, should it's, 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 we should record this. We should, one day we'll do that. It's interesting to talk about, and I think it, it's a subject that, that people... I mean, I understand why people are scared about talking about it. Yeah. The minute you talk about it... The minute it, you talk about you it... Get, you get, either way, either sense... If you... If you, if you <sighs> If yeah, you want to you question things about it, or if you want to show support for it, yeah. you get and, shit from different people each and time. And I think partly that comes down to so many people arguing in bad faith when yeah. it comes down to stuff like that. Because genuinely, most of the time, it's people who either want to catastrophize a, a, an outcome that's never going to happen, yeah. or is going to happen so rarely that it's statistically insignificant. Um, compared to the amount of good that it, that it sure. does. Um, and, and I think... I, and, and yeah, and so it does become difficult. It does become difficult, to, especially when you one of the, especially when you're someone who has to keep fighting that battle every single day. And some days it's you know sometimes it's gone. Yeah. Some days I've like really struggled with it and I've lashed out and then ended up in a fight online, and that never ends well because that normally ends with me having to block another thousand, <laughs> another thousand people who yeah. who go, why are you getting so upset, fella? Why don't you just calm down, mate? And you're just like, oh fuck off. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, and people trying to drag up all sorts of horrible like things from my past. Or you know, I regularly get people telling me that I oh, if you're so depressed, then you probably should kill yourself. You should go and fill in that. You know, the you should you should become one of the uh, forty three percent is the thing that because there was a statistic that I think it was uh, Scottish uh, trans uh, organisation figured out that forty three percent of I think it was, it was actually, I think it was over 50% of trans people have attempted suicide and 43% uh, of people, uh, well, after they've transitioned, attempt to. Um, and, you know, I'm one of that, to, one of that percentage. I, 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 like, that was, before I came out, that was where I'd ended up having to get pushed to, the point where I was just like, I can't carry on living this life anymore. And the fear of if I come out that my parents, not only would my parents reject me, but it would hurt them more for me to be alive and trans than to be dead. And so I tried to hang myself and tied my um, cord from my dressing gown around my light fitting in my bedroom and stepped off a chair and realized I probably should have done it before I put on six stones through comfort eating <laughs> and dragged an entire light fitting down <laughs> and just hit the ground and twisted my ankle. Again, the unluckiest person you've ever... <laughs> I once tried to gas myself in my car as well about three weeks after that because I was trying pretty frequently to kill myself at that point and found a spot in the woods where there was already... When I, f I picked out the perfect spot, drove off to the woods, discovered that someone had already parked there. Um, I, they weren't ending it. And, and so I drove off to try and find somewhere else and drove around for about an hour and a half and ran out of petrol. <laughs> And then had to walk like home. I think it was like ten miles from home 
at that point, it's like, for fuck's sake, this has extended my life, if anything. <laughs> um, you know, and... Yeah, it was like... Yeah, I... Because it, it's, it's so bizarre that someone would know that statistic and then not, you know, use it as a weapon rather than think, oh, maybe I should... Yeah, maybe, maybe I should... Maybe I shouldn't be a cunt to this person. Yeah. If there's a 50-50 chance a, of them actually killing there's themselves. There's a 50-50 chance of them actually killing themselves. And it, my, in my opinion, the world would be a safer place without them in it. It's, it's yeah. how they think. And it's that thing. They think that they're right and they think that what they're doing is safe and they think that what they're doing is going to make the world a safer place. And, and my view is that it doesn't. Um, on account of I'm one of the people who's lived through it and I really struggle on a daily basis because of a lot of the stuff that's been said and about that. And uh, so far, I've harmed fewer people than members of Girls Aloud have. <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm fairly sure. <laughs> I mean, I was trying to think because you were asking, uh, you were, I remember you saying the, uh, if there are any celebrities that have... Injured, and I think I gave Susie Quattro swine flu. Okay. But, <laughs> but other than that, I can't really okay. think of anything. So, you know, if, she, if, if Susie Quattro is listening, yeah. which I assume she is. She will be, yeah. She will be, yeah. She's a big fan. She's always bothering me to try and get Yeah, on. she is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's great that comedy can be used to discuss these subjects and, and define the comedy in the... In all these subjects, I mean, yeah. you know, like you say, the, there's the addictions you've had as well, and the and yeah. Oh, I was really good at that. Yeah, <laughs> really good but at it's, that. But you know, I think it, 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 all these things need to be talked about, and comedy is the best way to talk about them. I think. I think I think it is because everything that we do, we do with fun. Because if you like, I always think that like laughing is the moment when I can't remember who said it, but laughing is the moment when you forget you're going to die. <laughs> that's that's what it is. It's you laughing because you like I'm here. That's you are absolutely in the moment. And I think talking about things that are really important, you can actually get across a really really good message with that. And if you can make people laugh along the way, because so many of the horrible things that happen to us, we find hilarious anyway. Yeah. The amount the amount of times you'll be in the middle of like something that's really really like especially if you're a com if you've got a comedian's brain, if you're thinking jokes when you're in the middle of a really really horrible situation, you're going, oh, this is going to be so funny at some point. <laughs> It's going to be so funny one day. Like when I broke my leg and I was like lying there in agony on the floor in the middle of this leisure centre. I was like, I was, we were doing roller derby and I was, um, yeah, um, <laughs> obviously. And, and somebody kicked my foot and I got my foot caught behind my heel and twisted my foot 180 degrees and like double spiral fracture to my tibia and fibula. And I was lying there with my foot pointing in the wrong direction whilst people are skating around. And I was in absolute agony. And initially, you get like that rush of endorphins and you get a bit high and you're a bit daft. And then I started get going into pain. And my friend Danny, who was our, like, who like, was that like, team medic, came over and she was like next to me. She went, listen, it's okay. When you break something, you get like a rush of endorphins, like the body's natural painkillers. Um, after about 20 minutes, they start to go away and you, you might go into shock. That's what's happening now, but don't worry. There's a really easy way to get the endorphins going again. And I was like, anything, anything. And she went, masturbate. <laughs> I was like, you fucking what? <laughs> I'm in a leisure centre on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> with a broken leg with people skating around me. Fuck it, chuck a coat over me, I'll give it a go. And it's really difficult. Because you can't point your toes, that's the main thing. <laughs> but in the time when that was happening, I was lying there going, this is, this, this is, yeah, this this will be hilarious at yeah. some point. I mean, that's definitely the comedian's instinct. Yeah. I think also with comedy as well, if 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 you can make people laugh about something, and even if they if they disagree with you or if they've got a prejudice against you, then it you know, it, and if they if they're not yeah. viewing you as as the same as them or as, uh, or not viewing you as human, you know, that it, yeah, that, that it humanizes. I yeah, and yeah, the, absolutely the agree with that. Yeah, because there's so many times that I do that, and because and so, almost all of my, I don't often talk about being trans on stage. I don't talk on about being trans on stage as often as I would like. Like most Friday and Saturday night gigs, I struggle with it just because when I do mention it, it's like I don't. None of the bits that I have about it are short and snappy enough to really <laughs> go into a club set twenty. I really need to sort of like go into more depth. Of or give them more perspective, because like, if I go up there on stage and go, hello, so, let's talk about being transgender, shall we? Um, an audience just like, hey, what? No, because first of all, I know I don't look like they expect a comedian to look like, and I don't sound like they expect a comedian to sound like, and I think when they hear the name Bethany Black, they don't 
immediately assume that I'll look like this. So when I get up on stage, I, what I've started to do is not even mention that I'm a lesbian until about five minutes into it, because it, that makes them awkward as well. <laughs> and then I reference that it's made them awkward, because you can see them about five minutes in if I don't mention it going, does she know? <laughs> I mean, I can tell, but can she, does she know? <laughs> I don't want to be the one to tell her. And it's lovely to see people doing that, but I do talk about th those sorts of things on stage. And, it's, and often it's a case, it, often it's a way of, 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 doing, of, of bringing, you know, things that people haven't really had much experience of and showing that, there's, showing that there, are, there are similarities and differences, but that, you know, the things that we can find funny, we can all find funny. Yeah. You know, um, without it having to be... Like, horrible. Because that that's the thing, because there are so many comedians out there who go, oh, you can't joke about anything anymore. You can. Just yeah. don't be a cunt. <laughs> that's, literally, that is all. Don't be boring. Don't do jokes that everyone's already done. Um, that's pretty much it, really. There are so many jokes that you can tell, yeah. and people choose not to. And, uh, and they instead decide to go down the same old route that they've done, like, a thousand times before, where yeah. they'll just... You know, especially when it comes to trans stuff, where they get halfway through and go, oh, I've not been this confused since I was last in Thailand. <laughs> They're like, oh, you prick. <laughs> do you find, do you get, do audit, when audiences, and, and we, you do talk about it, do you get heckled by audiences or are they, because no. in person, that's interesting, isn't it? That if, yeah, in person, no, they never do. Yeah. They never do. Some people, you can see them getting really angry and uncomfortable. <laughs> right. and, and obviously, those are the ones I then deliver the rest of the material directly <laughs> to as far as possible, walk over to them and just talk right into their faces with it until, yeah. Um, but no, people, like that, because I think that was the thing that I was really worried about when I first started talking about it on stage, um, was that I'd get heckled. And, and the thing is, not a single thing that anyone has ever heckled, and I say this, on, this is absolutely true, I say this on stage now, not a single thing that anyone has ever heckled me with in, uh, in 18 years of doing stand-up has been anywhere near as upsetting as the sort of thing that my mum would say just during the average 15-minute phone conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. Um, and the example I give of that was about, uh, about a year ago. It was one of the most pure examples of that. I was on the phone to her, and whilst I was talking to her, I banged my knee. And she went, are you all right? I went, yeah, I banged my knee. And she went, yeah, you do need to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> I love my mum. She's fucking yeah. wonderful. When I came out to my mum as trans, her response was, but we've just had a conservatory built. And <laughs> she's wonderful. She's lovely. And, and I love her to pieces because this was it. Because I was talking to her about this because I said to her and my dad, I've been a big fan of yours since, since, I, was, since I was little. I've got all of, like, apart from the DVDs that you sound to I'm going to buy. And, and the rest of you do as well. I've got all of, you, all of your DVDs. So this was as much a sort of like, <laughs> I was super excited about doing this. And, and I said to my parents, like, I'm doing the Richard Daring. That's the Square Theatre podcast, or whatever, uh, the, uh, the Roy Hood language <laughs> school podcast. And, uh, and, and I said, you know, I'm dead excited about it. Do you want to come? And they went, uh, yeah, yeah, we might do. And, <laughs> oh, and it's, really, it's a really, really big deal for me. Like, oh, yeah. um, we've, we've, we've got an opportunity to go to uh, a caravan in Kendall for the weekend. <laughs> so, all right, okay. So they're, they're in Kendall right now, enjoying themselves. <laughs> And I spoke to my mum this morning because she said, like, she'd listened to the... She said, I listened to the Dawn French one. And I said, oh, right, what did you think? She goes, well, he'll go on and he'll say some funny things. And then he'll introduce you and then you'll talk for a bit. And if you go off track, he'll guide you. So it should be easy. <laughs> and I was like, that was, that was it, was it? Yeah, 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 that was everything. Um, she's got my she's, number. Yeah, she has. She knows... She does. She knows you very, very well. Um, but yeah, that was yeah yeah. <laughs> I don't even know why I started telling that. Well, story. it's about it's about being heckled but, and stuff. Yeah. But you know, it's, 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 it's really great to have an opportunity to talk to you about all that. But I also sort of think we shouldn't have to as well, you know. But it's it's, it's that's yeah. the, that's the difficult with all of these. Well, it's subjects, that thing. It's like you know? yeah, you go oh, do you know yeah? It's that thing of like we didn't, and and now suddenly it's like well yeah, we've we've got a lot of catching up to do. Because for a lot of people, it's because this is the thing, like the amount of times I've seen people online going, oh, it's all new, isn't it? Suddenly all these trans people turning up. <laughs> Where have they all come from? I'm like, well, we've always been here. Like, you've, we've been among you for as long as you've, have, as long as there have been people. There have been trans people in your toilets for as long as there have been toilets. You know, we're not like fucking spiders. You know, you go, oh, glass over the top, take them outside. No, it's like we've, we have been as part of, society for as long as there's been society we we've existed and the thing is that now 
more people are able to talk to each other and more people are able to go, actually, I don't really fit in along this idea. And I think that that's a good thing. I think that's the thing that we're opening up and we're able to go, do you know what? I struggle with things. I have difficulty. Because that's, that's like the core of almost all mental illnesses. This, this, I, I struggle with things and I need a way to be able to get around it. But so much of the stuff is caused by external factors. You know, it's like... Um, you know, this is because I've just I've been working really hard with a psychotherapist for the last three months, uh, last six months, and she's been really fucking good, and she's really not used to dealing with people who are autistic and 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 problem solving focused. Because she went, oh, I think maybe you should do this, and most people go away going, I'm not doing what she tells me. Whereas I go away and come back and go, I did exactly what you told me, <laughs> and it turns out my life's perfect now. So <laughs> if anything, I'm too mentally healthy. Um, and it's, yeah, and, and so much of that, that I've realised is just people not recognising that you've got to talk about stuff. It's, it's about saying to other people, these things make me feel uncomfortable and I want to feel comfortable because we all deserve to feel comfortable. Don't and everyone's got something, you know, it might, it might not be 15 <laughs> things all at once yeah, yeah. like it is for you, but everyone's got something. Yeah, yeah. And, and hearing people talk about that, at least you go, oh, they can talk about that and I can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think if you could talk about all of these things yeah. it's, it's, it's enormous because you know a lot of people think Mike if that was me or if I had yeah. two of those things I'd be I'd be yeah. I'd be, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be in a much worse state yeah. <laughs> I've only got... oh well you're all lucky to have had me here there tonight. you are I hope yeah. you've yeah. realised certainly are right let's ask you a couple of emergency questions then yeah. we'll go and have a drink let's do it yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'll, actually I've got some new well, who is the most famous person that you've ever been in a lift with that you didn't get into the lift with <laughs> I mean, you know, that you weren't Yeah, with yeah, that time. wasn't with at the time. Um, Might not be anyone. It's a tricky question. <laughs> that is a tricky question, because yeah. I'm just trying to think. Um, Andrew Hayden-Smith. Okay. Who was also in Doctor Who. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but who uh, was in a different episode of Doctor Who from me. But, uh, yeah, I think that... Is he... Is he, is he, is he who's Hayden? Is he he, he was the one... I think he's in Hollyoaks now. He's, okay. And he was, in, he was in The Rise of the Cybermen. Okay. The the uh, the David Tennant Cybermen story. What did he, he do was, in the lift? Did he do anything he interesting in the lift? No, no, nothing, nothing interesting in the lift. He was a boring lift compatriot. Well, at least we've learned that about him. Yeah. Um, if you could you have... trust him in a lift. <laughs> I mean, that is. I mean, I think the TARDIS counts as a kind of lift. Yeah. I'm quite excited that they've got a, a time you know, lift. That yeah. they said, "Do you want to see my TARDIS?" Do you think they think? That they really, I mean, are they really TARDISes? Yeah, I think they really are. I think like, they, do you want well, to have a go on my TARDIS? Well, we did, because we had a go, and we went back, and you won't know this, but uh, until, until 2015, uh, England never won the World Cup in 66. So, you know, we went back, <laughs> wow. and we did that. That was, that was what we did with that afternoon on the <laughs> That's TARDIS. That's brilliant. Um, if you could have any one item from any art gallery or museum in the world to keep, all the art galleries and museums say, you can, we're going to give you one thing, and it's yours... What would it be? It can be a work of art or it can be a, you know, an item that you fancy having from a... Oh, I mean, the velvet rope that they have around the... <laughs> <laughs> that they have around stuff. Yeah. I'd like some of that for my house. You can probably get that. I can probably get that, couldn't you I? Can yeah, buy yeah, that. Yeah. But you would get it for free. Yeah. I mean, if uh, you chose an expensive painting, you could sell that and get a lot of velvet rope. Though. Yeah, I could. Yeah, if I got the Mona Lisa, I could like go and like draw a hat on it and then sell it. <laughs> I think that's, I think she'd look good in a hat. Yeah. I think that's what's missing from that. Actually, do you know what? Which one I'd go for? What? I'd go for a piece of artwork uh, by Coolidge called A Bold Bluff. Okay. Which is more often known as uh, the dogs playing poker. Okay. It's yeah. the original of that. That's the one I'd want. Okay, that's a good choice. I yeah. think that'd be so, a very nice thing to So have. then I could go and make it into an even better artwork by cutting it in half and putting it in two jugs of formaldehyde. Like a Damien Hirst. <laughs> Combine the two greatest artists of all time. I've kind of got to ask you about yeah, yeah. a time travelling finger because oh, you yeah, like Doctor travel. Who so much. So if, you could, if your finger could travel through time, where would it go and what would it get up to? <laughs> Just thinking of all the people I could poke in the eye. Uh, yeah, or anywhere. <laughs> yeah, oh, mate, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, God, I don't know. Where would I go? Oh, I'd go back and flick Hitler, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's a popular choice for choosing the same hairstyle yeah. as you. Oh, yeah, yeah that's exactly. Mine. Yeah, yeah, that is, yeah, that's... Well, look, it's... Um, <laughs> you're, you are a fantastic stand-up comedian and actor, I have to say. I hope, oh, is there more stuff on the, in the, on the way with the, 
yeah. acting? Have you got more acting I've jobs? not got any more acting that's coming out at the moment because um, I'm over 40. And, <laughs> and so as a result, everyone went, oh, for, like I got loads and loads of them. And I was like turning things down and going, oh, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. And then I got to 40 and I got like three auditions last year. and went, oh, okay, come on. Um, No, I've got, um, yeah, I'll be doing, I'm sure I'll be taking a show out on the road somewhere. And I'm currently writing stuff as well. I've been asked to write my memoir. Yeah, great. My, uh, my agent went, oh, we've got someone in our books department to come and to have a chat with. And I went and she went, I've been told you I need to listen to your life story. And I went, all right then. And I started telling it. And about five minutes in, you could see pound signs appear in her eyes before her jaw hit her like, chest. She was like, your life has been shit. <laughs> oh, we're going to get so rich. Well, that's uh, good. I hope you yeah. do. <laughs> Uh, I fucking hope so. Because I'm not well. lending you any money to go no. to get bankrupt again. <laughs> uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a massive round of applause. Bethany Black! Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I'll see you after the bar. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>